So in the last half hour of this session, we will hear a keynote talk from William Zhang, who is the founder of the Unitary Fund and the head of quantum research at Goldman Sachs. Will, take it away. Great, thanks Travis. So before I bring up some slides, uh, I just wanna say that it's really awesome to see everything today come together. Uh, when I started my PhD, mostly all quantum algorithms were written in LaTeX, which is a pretty rough quantum programming language. Uh, though it's pretty flexible, it turns out as well. Um, and it's amazing that there are now quantum software conferences. There's a place where we can have talks that could easily have filled multiple days. Uh, so I, I'm really excited to be here and, and see everything that you, you all are building. So the talk I'm going to give today uh, it should be a little fun. It's just kind of at the end, not that technical. Um, can you see that, Travis? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, it's four strategies for the early quantum jungle. And I'm going to talk a little bit in metaphors. And I think metaphors are important to help out when you're in a new area where you don't know what you're doing. And uh, I think that describes the state of quantum software today. <laughs> uh, we know a lot more than we knew five years ago, but we, we sort of know enough to know that uh, there's a lot left to come. Uh, and so a bit about me. Um, so I, I'm not just on the tools and software side. That's an area where I worked, worked on hardware as well, but I'm also in the user side. Um, so I run an algorithms research group at Goldman that's trying to figure out how are we going to make quantum computing useful for, uh, for financial services. Or at least from my perspective, it's we need to find that use case. But in order to get there, we need better tools. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, a lot of people in quantum are, are fascinated by the history of computing, and, and we try and use it to help explain where we are now. Uh, and if you haven't read a book called Where Wizards Stay Up Late by Katie Hafner, I really recommend it. Uh, it's about the origins of the internet and how a lot of things were developed. Another group of technical people working in an area where they didn't know what they were doing and no one did and they had to make up concepts. Uh, but from that book comes a quote that I like, which says the process of technological development is like building a cathedral. Uh, over the course of several hundred years, new people come along and each lays down a block on top of the old foundations, each saying, I built a cathedral. Next month, another block is placed atop the previous one. Then comes along a historian who asks, well, who built the cathedral? Peter added some here, Paul added a few more, but if you're not care and if you're not careful, you can con yourself into believing that you did the most important part. But the reality is that each contribution has to follow onto previous work and everything is tied into everything else. So this is a great perspective on the collaborative nature of building, but I think it doesn't go far enough. And a cathedral is not the metaphor that, that I'd advocate for. It's actually a different one which is that cathedrals aren't quite right because they're static and monolithic. And I actually think technological development is a lot more like trying to plant a jungle where you have a bunch of interacting components that are moving dynamically, sometimes in predator and prey relationships with each other and filling different kinds of niches. And so we know what a really robust and lush jungle looks like. And that's what we really want for the quantum ecosystem. Uh, and that's what Unitary Fund works on. So, so Unitary Fund, a couple of folks have, uh, Nathan and Ryan have been paneling, uh, moderating the panels. I think it's a verb. Uh, moderating the panels today. Uh, and Unity runs a nonprofit that's trying to help create this, this lush quantum technology ecosystem because that help is, this ecosystem will help benefit the most people if we take this model. Jungles are pretty accessible. And so we think an open ecology will help make the benefits of quantum tech happen faster and for more people. So the strategies I'm going to talk about today with little uh, analogies from jungles are about healthy soil, so building bottoms of community about niches and the value of targeting them, about specialization in how you choose modular designs with small footprint, and a little bit about symbiosis. But before I go into those, um, I wanna use Unitary Fund as a little case study on what you can get when you're in the environment of a healthy ecology, because I've been surprised by how much we've been able to do with a small group. So, so what does Unitary Fund do? Well, two main programs. One is we run a microgrant program which gives 4K no strings attached grants to open quantum tech projects. We funded uh, compilers, simulators, educational tools, and more. I'll give you some examples. And we're supported by uh, some of the main players in the industry, some of the folks who, who talked here today. And then we also this year started a team called Unitary Labs, which does open source research. Uh, and the first project we've worked on is called MIDIC, and it's an open source error mitigating compiler. But we're also supporting other projects like uh, Q-tip, which is another big uh, main one that's been around for a while. And, and a lot of this is, is with a bunch of collaborators too. So the small microgram program, 4K, you know, people are raising 200, $300 million for their quantum startups. 
does it matter? Well, it does. Small micro grants can have a really big impact. I've been surprised by how much over the last uh, about two years that we've been doing this, uh, we've been able to build. So we've funded 30 projects, 14 countries, seven published publications, one venture funded startup, a bunch of libraries. And one of my favorites are new folks who are now working full time in the field whose first thing in quantum computing or quantum technologies was a unitary fund project. Or maybe they did a PhD years ago and they went back in industry and they wanted to get back. And all of that was done with about 90K, which is sort of less than the cost of an all-in graduate student for a single year. And you know, it's not just little small publications. Each of these projects can start to become an ecosystem in and of itself. Um, so in Armenia, we, the project we funded there now became the first quantum computing course uh, in Armenia, which has a long history in, in computing uh, as a nation. Uh, and now they've actually started their first institute as well. They couldn't afford a Dilfridge but we were able to help them target and figure out what to work on that'd be useful from a research perspective on the software side. So what are some of the things we funded? So uh, examples here are this QRAC, which is an open source uh, GPU accelerated framework for, it's a simulator. I mean, we, we've talked about a lot of simulators here, but this one is faster than CERC simulator, than Qiskit simulator, than, uh, than a lot of other simulators that are out there. I wish I could show you a full benchmark of this simulator against everything else, but that hasn't been developed yet. And so if anyone wants to really invest in helping benchmark things, you should. But this was built by someone who was a, is a software engineer uh, who you know, picked up the uh, mathematical side, but hadn't been working in quantum. We've also funded the first fully featured software stack for quantum network protocols. We've talked about stacks for quantum computing today, but stacks for quantum networks are important as well. Uh, and we funded a, a, an optimal compiler, which uh, you can compare against things like TCAT or, or other kinds of um, compilers to see how it performs, but it, it outperforms them. We're also able to not just fund individual pieces of software, but help connect the pieces together. So one of the projects that we funded this year was a connection between Yao JL, which is a Julia environment, really the sort of top, one of the top, Julia, one of the top Julia environments for, for quantum programming who wanted to integrate another unitary fund project called PISIX, which is a ZX-based compiler. And so they were able to, they, they were building a domain specific language called Yaolang, and they were able to integrate ZX as one of the compiler and optimization passes inside of it. And not just funding software, but investing in people. So I've already mentioned uh, the Gate42 work in Armenia, but we, we actually just gave another extension grant that we announced today to QWorld who've been funding, this is just, uh, these workshops they talk about here across seven countries in Eastern Europe are just their first round from May to July 2019. They've continued that. Uh, and Leah, who's been asking some questions here, uh, received one of our grants to help build out the full stack quantum computation community and meta community and, and, and website for folks to come together and, uh, and build resources and get, get into technology. And, and these are the people that are going to be using the platforms that we just heard about <laughs> in, uh, in this session. So Unitary Fund itself uh, is an, you know, why can we do this? We have help, uh, a bunch of experts and systems and software, some of whom are here now, and a community that's growing. But, you know, wh why does this work so effectively? Like, why are we able to do this with less than the cost of a single graduate student for a single year on like a standard grant? And the reason is that we have an open source environment that's intentional. So there are a lot of the open, a lot of hardware is available and a lot of software has, has been released to become available. And I, I want to emphasize that it didn't have to happen this way. We didn't, we don't, we did, there was nothing that forced us to have to be in a world where there are a lot of open source projects. So we sort of look at a timeline gesturally, and I mean, this is just gestural, they're not meant to be totally accurate historically, but there's sort of an academic prehistory where some of the original packages um, were built up in, in quantum software. Uh, there was a program called the QCS program. Uh, which was unfortunately had its funding in the US, had its funding cut in 2013, but that's where Quipper and SCAF CC and a lot of the original resource estimation projects came out. I, I wish that program had gotten to go on for a few more years, uh, but we've been able to pick it up ever since. And then there was this moment in, let's say 2016, 2017, when some of the first folks making hardware available decided to go the open source access route. Uh, and we had the IBM Quantum Experience. We had the things we did with PyQuill uh, and Forest, which I got to be a part of at Rigetti. Project you came about, that was an academic project, but the industry projects coming out and saying, we're gonna make open source libraries has started a trend that's continued to grow in today's open environment. And so the reason I, I mentioned a little bit of this historical context is that 
it doesn't ju just to point out that it ju doesn't just happen automatically. Um, there are lots of industries and technologies that get developed in very closed ways. It could have been very reasonable when building quantum computers for any of the first folks to say, you know, these are machines most people won't understand. We're going to make them a big black box and we're going to try and sell the big, big black boxes uh, to very specialized uh, people. And the decision was made to go another way. And we should continue to make those kind of intentional decisions going forward. Uh, and all, I think a lot of you here are, are making them. Um, but if you if you ever think that it's just inevitable, you should remember that it's not. So where are we today and where, where can we go further? So we do have a lot of different uh, packages and open source libraries available. But the analogy <laughs> here is that I, I think a little bit today we're building a jungle that look, looks kind of like, uh, like this. Um, where there are open ecosystems, but they're still sort of in vertical stacks and they're often sort of duplicating features across each other, uh, which isn't necessarily bad. Maybe they're coming up with new things, but it definitely looks different than where we want to go, which is a rich and interlocking ecology and shared soil. So this is a sort of a metaphor to keep in our background, uh, in, your, in, your, in the back of your mind about, about where we could be going with the software ecosystem. Uh, and importantly, this, this here doesn't look like standardization, right? So sometimes it can seem like, oh, there are it can seem as if there are many vertical stacks that are different and we should standardize across them and build a, uh, a, you know, a factory farm. But that is something that's different than a jungle. And I think less robust and less verdant. And so why do we need to make this, this robust jungle? Well, the fundamental reason is that there's a long way to go in order for us to get to large valuable markets for quantum computing. And it's those valuable large markets that are gonna start a positive feedback loop for investment in the field so that we can build the technology to do all the things that we wanna do and have the change that we wanna have. And if you have vertical exclusive stacks then they're gonna to be too fragile to go the distance. Because there's a long way to go, there are things that are gonna get invented. I mean, if there aren't, it's gonna be really rough, but there are all sorts of things that are gonna change in how we think about quantum computing. Variational programming is relatively new. That was a big shift. There's going to be something that's a shift like that that happens. It might be related to how we do quantum error correction. I'm not sure. Um, but we should be open and not surprised if the APIs and intermediate representations that we have today end up getting thrown out in a couple of years for very good reasons. And so in order to build things that last, I think you need to build as if you're building something in a jungle. Uh, and so the, this sort of the reason to come back to these four strategies. Uh, so the first is around making sure that there's a healthy soil for the jungle to live in. The second is to make sure you're building something that's really targeting a niche where it can survive. And the third is to make sure you specialize because that's sort of a key to surviving in a given niche. And then the fourth is to advocate for symbiosis. So I think the help on how are we doing on each of these, the, on the healthy soil prospect, uh, I'm bullish. You know, there's a lot of bottoms up community building happening all over everything from there's something like 22 billion uh, in research and government funding that's happening across the globe. Uh, I think Kiskit's global summer school had more than 6,000. I don't know what the final number was a uh, number of people participating in it, which I think almost maybe that just doubles the field <laughs> in terms of the number of people who have programmed uh, on a quantum computer. And so that's amazing. Uh, there's the work we do at Unitrade Fund, there's a quantum open source foundation, there's, uh, all, there's all sorts of, this is not exhaustive either, there's all sorts of stuff happening uh, to try and build and, and uh, invest in the, in the community. So if you wanna get involved in these efforts, um, you can, you can, you can uh, reach out to any of these people, you can ping me at willunitrade.fund and I'd love to help you get connected. I think also what's important is to recognize contributions because sometimes when you invest in the soil, uh, it doesn't stand out. I mean, people look for the big, you know, redwood tree and say, that's the amazing thing that got grown when really it was the, the soil itself that made it possible to grow that tree. Uh, and so one thing that I'm, you know, really personally proud to be involved in is the Wittick Quantum Prize for Open Source Software that we announced last week, um, which is a prize that's going to go to a perhaps otherwise unnoticed individual for outstanding high impact contributions to the field of quantum open source software. And that's a team up between Unitary Fund and the Quantum Open Source Software Foundation. Uh, we've got nominations open until November 30th. So uh, if you think yourself or someone you know is, is deserving, then just go to wittickprize.com and we're really excited to, 
see those nominations. Second is about niches. And uh, you know, there's a lot of open source projects I could use here, but I'm gonna use one of our ones from Unitary Fund as an example. Because this, this sort of niche process was what in, went into how we decided to build Mythic. So uh, what is the niche to target with this new species? Uh, well, error mitigation is key for noisy quantum computing and our quantum computers are very noisy today. So today, you, know, you could uh, cross your fingers uh, or, or, you know, try and use some variational technique that's, that's potentially going to help you out a bit. And, and long term, we're going to have error correction of some kind, which will have overheads of additional qubits and require fast classical control, It'll require you to potentially be at some threshold of performance in order for them to kick in. Uh, and in between is sort of what I'll class as mitig error mitigation schemes. And there's a lot of stuff in here. The, uh, it, it, they're really clever. There's a lot of fun little technical techniques. Um, ranging from probabilistic error cancellation to zero noise extrapolation, which is the one that Mitic focuses on first. Um, so th these are going to be very, very important over the coming years. And they're going to critically affect benchmarking for the years to come. So the next three, five, I don't know, 10 years are going to consist of this steady march of comparing hardware QPU against QPU, comparing software against software, comparing algorithms against algorithms as we start to benchmark to approach some kind of quantum advantage. And these error mitigating techniques can make a big, big difference in how a benchmark performs. We're talking orders of magnitude and the accuracy of some expectation value. And so if you don't have an open solution, then you're going to have a lot of benchmarks that are going to be comparing apples to oranges. You won't know if it's the hardware or the algorithm or the error mitigation that helped you get to some kind of benchmark. So a standard is really, really helpful to just understand what's going on. Secondly, if everyone has to implement to get to the state of the art of error mitigation, then that is going to be a big overhead if what you actually want to do is show that your hardware is better, or if what you actually want to do is show that your algorithm is better. You now also have the additional task of implementing all the error mitigation. So by having an open solution that's accessible, you can reduce time to state of the art for everyone. And the third bit is that if it's open and the things everyone can contribute to, then it's sort of a snowball effect of techniques. There are many different techniques that work for error mitigation. We don't know which ones are going to be best, but if you can have them all co combined in something that everyone can use, then you can start to piece them together and compose them in some way that is a uh, whole is greater than some of its parts uh, kind of effect and is better than the alternative, which is where everyone who's building some platform or some vertical uh, stack of plants makes their own error mitigating scheme as the way to differentiate. Really, they can differentiate on the algorithm and they can differentiate on the hardware. Uh, and so with Mythic, uh, that's what we set out to build. Um, we had to do a little bit of theory in order to make sure that uh, this first error mitigating technique that we were working on was actually portable across different APIs and platforms. A whole other talk. Um, but you can check that out. There's actually a talk. It's a whole other talk on Wednesday, um, I think, uh, at IEEE Quantum Week that uh, Tudor's giving. Um, but we've tried to make it simple. So in Qiskit, you know, you, you have some, this is just a series of X gates, you run it, you get some error. And if you import a quick wrapper and you wrap your expectation, then your error goes down and you can do the same thing in circ. Um, it's just a, it's a similar kind of one liner. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the design here as well uh, later. Oh, so uh, Mitic's available now in Alpha. Go check it out. It's on GitHub. But error mitigation is not the only niche that has some of these properties which will make it last and make it impactful. And I'll just list a couple others that come to mind. So benchmarking is one that is a big one. Benchmarking of uh, hardware, benchmarking of compilers um, is a big deal. Uh, that there's not a, a standard set of circuits or a standard set of applications to run to compare compilers against each other. That would be extremely useful. Uh, transpiling between everyone. We, a lot of us are writing ways to transpile between different platforms. It'd be great to just do this once and be done and have something that every time someone adds some new platform, you can just add it to the open source transpiler and now we've all got it. Debugging and IDEs. I mean, debugging uh, 20 circuits, 20 qubits is, is already uh, a pain in and of itself. How are we going to debug a, a thousand noisy qubits? I think is a very open and greenfield area. And then, 
you know, integration with the broader open source ecosystem. And here, I mean the non-quantum part. So we just funded another unitary fund project, which was to work on building uh, random number generation. And the way they want to do it is not to build some quantum open source library necessarily, but to build it as a plugin for NumPy. So everybody who's getting random states from NumPy can just add a little bit and then they can get a new, uh, get a quantum random number source. Uh, and all these would make great unitary fund projects. So the third bit is uh, specialization. So here the uh, perspective is to suggest building tools and not just platforms. Platforms are good and useful, um, but they're hard to make go the distance. So in choosing Mythic, I'll use Mythic as the example here again. So in choosing Mythic, we could have done a platform style. We didn't do it this way, but you could have said, let's take a user program. Let's run it through Mythic. Mythic will talk to whatever backend you want. We'll have all the different backend integrations, and then we'll pass back the answer to the user. This has some downsides architecturally. So you have some limited support. You can only support the backends that have code to integrate them with Mythic. You can make that relatively easy to write, make it a plugin, but you still have to add it. It's also got a relatively high maintenance burden. Every time one of those backends changes, and these are all almost all uh, you know, barely 1.0 APIs, you need to keep up with it. Uh, the Mythic maintainer needs to keep up with it. Uh, and the third is the user might get locked in. So if they want to create some new backend or they want to move stuff around, then, uh, then they're a bit limited. And the alternative we chose was what I'd call like an example of tool style. Uh, and so what happens here is the user takes their program and they also have a backend that they've wrapped in some way and they pass both to Mythic and then Mythic pushes pieces them together to give, to give an answer. Uh, and so what that looks like is we define a, I mean, it's, it's a simple example intentionally, but in, in Mythic we choose an, we abstract a backend to be an executor. It's just a thing that takes in some quantum program. This could be a circ circuit, a uh, Qiskit a quantum circuit, a PyQuil program or um, other things that transpile between OpenCASM and it just gives you back a number because that's what a quantum computer does. You give it a program and it gives you a number back. Um, and as long as you have an executor, which in this case, let's say is this noisy simulation object, then I can wrap it and then I can run with your user program on it to get back an answer. And what's nice here is that now a user can define anything that fits this type signature and compose it up together and use it with Mythic's techniques. So there's a, it is a lower maintenance burden. We don't have to support all these different kinds of backends. Uh, and it's very, very flexible. So I'd advocate think, sort of think, when you when you look to build something, think about it in 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 uh, in these two paradigms. The last bit, and I don't have a huge amount to say here, is that symbiosis is good. Uh, we should keep upstreaming things. I guess my comment here is that it still seems like a lot of the major libraries are developed by um, one uh, group. There are some exceptions. Uh, you know, Open Fermion is a great example. I think Penny Lane too, where there's lots of different organizations that contribute in. Um, but many of them are, are sort of dominated by uh, kind of a big player. Uh, and that causes it, you know, pe people are hesitant to contribute back in, but you should, you should push through that because it can lead to great things. Like in trying to build Mythic, we decided not to build our own Quill import and export in Mythic. We just upstreamed it into Circ and then used it through that. Um, and one thing that, you know, is worth thinking about is if you're using uh, quantum open source software that's a major dependency, maybe contribute to that every once in a while. Look at the roadmap, look at the issues that are there, and maybe help close some bugs. Even if they don't go exactly to what you're building, it will make that software better and more robust and free up the other devs who are working on it to also work on that software. So those are the four uh, things I wanted to mention. Today, there's a, there's a whole bunch more uh, about ecology. This is sort of a practice for a <laughs> much, much longer talk, maybe. Um, but healthy soil is important, targeting niches, specializing in them, and then trying to be symbiotic with the other things that are out there. So I'll leave you with one uh, other thought uh, before I close, which is, can we get open source closer to the metal? Um, for example, in control systems firmware. And you might ask, why is this important? Um, you know, it's uh, it's, open source still sort of already dominates the major user space for quantum programming. But I think over the coming years that close to the metal classical programming is going to become increasingly important. You're not going to be able to do it 
over, you're not going to do the same kind of feedback and control over a cloud API that you used to. It's going to be too slow for some of these things. So, uh, you know, examples, quantum error correction, mitigation, detection. A lot of that might be happening in an FPGA that's next to a DAC or an ADC that's controlling the pulses that control your quantum system. Or it might even be in classical logic that's cold in a fridge or on the same chip or, or in some, depending on what hardware technology you're using, just in some way really close to the system. And so that's a very different thing than coding uh, in Python and sending over objects. And I think is, is, is going to be a very important uh, realm for doing useful quantum programming. So we should think about it. Can, can open source get closer to that metal and be useful? Uh, variational programming has been talked about a lot. That's already, uh, I think, covered well. And the third is to mention that there are really new architectures beyond the just basic circuit model that matter and I think are going to matter if you want to squeeze quantum advantage out. Folks are mixing continuous variable systems with digital systems. They're mixing qubits with qubits in clever and interesting ways. Um, and there's going to need to be software that controls all that. So uh, I'd like to entreat you to help grow a, a vibrant and fertile quantum jungle um, that looks like this, or, or maybe it should look like this, uh, as, as we do. Uh, and if you'd like to help out with Unitary Fund, uh, you can. Uh, we could use your help. You could become a supporter, help spread the word, become a mentor, or help contribute code to the many open source projects that, uh, that are out there. And they're, they're all just sort of listed on our website. So thanks again for, for the time. It's lovely to see you all. Wonderful. Thank you for that talk, Will, and for those very inspiring and, and thoughtful comments. And you know, I know the National Quantum Coordination Office now has the, the quantum eagle, or yeah. quiggle, <laughs> as John Presco has allegedly called it. So maybe we'll get the, the quantum forest or something like that. Um, so you know, we have- On that, you know, we, we, we that's why the original Rigetti um, software stack was called Forest. Oh. For this, this reason, the intention was to try and- you know, so, so this, this analogy has actually been sitting in your mind for, for a long, <laughs> long time. It wasn't like you were just sitting in your apartment in the city and, and came up with it. So we, we, we have hit kind of the, the 90 minute mark for the session here. We can do uh, some questions and whatnot. I have at least one. Um, RP has one. He says, what are the top two or three benchmarks you'd like to see initially as building blocks for others? Um, one I mentioned, I think uh, there's a lot of really amazing work going on in compilation. Um, and there are all these different techniques that get put together in different ways. Uh, if we had a set of circuits which was relatively standardized, or it's, it's hard because it, when you include variational stuff, then it's not just a static circuit. So that has to get solved. Um, but some standard way to benchmark compilers against each other, I think would really help the research community uh, stand on the shoulder of giants. So that's one. Um, another is, you know, some set of initial uh, NISCI application level benchmarks. I think we're kind of there. I mean, there's things you see in papers that have just come up, like everyone does H2 uh, with VQE um, and lots of people do QAOA on max cut. Um, but, you know, we're, as we get more sophisticated systems with 50, 100, 200 noisy qubits, uh, we're going to want to run different examples. What are they going to be? Um, and they should be, uh, you know, uh, targeted and not just sort of coming up randomly. So th those, those are two that I would sort of, would it sounds like it's that, that notion of intentionality, like you said, with the growth of the, the open source ecosystem, like we should be intentional in what we're trying to benchmark, why we're trying to benchmark it, and what that actually tells us about future hardware development and whatnot. Yeah. Um, a question from Leah says, uh, what might it look like to reach out to open source control systems, e.g. Uh, RT for a trapped ion quantum computing, to drive open source from the bottom up and not just from the top down? Yeah, um, I'm not sure I know. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I think that's a great question. I mean, I know that there are, I mean, Arctic, uh, for those who don't know, is a, is, is a pretty, gosh, it's, it's been around for a while, but it's, 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 it's a, a PGA control software for ion traps. Um, and there are lots of projects to build control systems. Uh, they're happening in-house at most of the players, but there are also companies who are building dedicated control systems, uh, like sort of instruments um, or quantum machines. Uh, and it would be interesting to talk to them. I haven't, uh, probably should, uh, but we should talk to, as, as the open source community, we should talk to them and say, can we help? 
right. <laughs> you know, what are the things you're building? Uh, one thing that's kind of also in this vein um, is the Open Pulse standard and libraries mm -hmm. that came out from IBM. Uh, yeah. That's kind of sort of in between. It's not. It's not quite under the control layer. But but I think having because I think the discussion has to not has to be about building software for the things that are coming in the next couple of years. Right. That looks like. Uh, the other thing is there's also academic groups. I mean, ac talking with academic groups and trying to help, because they don't want to hire lots and lots of FPGA engineers to do their uh, physics. Their you know, they want right. to do physics. Right. Um, so maybe that's somewhere where we can find like ready users and ready customers who aren't worried about value capture um, to try out different open source solutions that folks build. Right, right. Okay, I will ask one question and then I'll see if anybody uh, has some other questions in the chat here. So, you know, you made this analogy uh, about the forest and growing a, a quantum forest as it were, but sometimes a forest ends up dying, not because it decays, but because lots of external forces come in, you know, forest fires um, or just deforestation and just sort of like, right, cuts the whole thing down. So as you look out in the world and, and the current kind of situation of the world, what are some of those external forces which could influence the trajectory of this quantum jungle? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> let's go with the analogy because it's fun. Um, but let's say that funding is like rain. So it needs to rain in order to, for things to grow. There needs to be funding. But there could be, a, we're in a nice period where it's raining pretty well and things are starting to grow, um, but there could be a drought. And I think there could be a real drought if we don't find a value, you know, okay, I'm going to say it in two ways, but if we find a valuable large market application for quantum computers and we understand it really, really well, then that's going to keep, you know, the irrigation the system rain, or the right, rain. The rain will come. Yeah. We might not be, we, and, and it's not, you know, we don't have to go all the way to deploying a quantum computer in production and running it. But even if we just knew exactly how many qubits and exactly how much better it would be, uh, where the, where the answer is not like a hundred million qubits, where, where the answer is something a little bit closer. Um, then I think that will help us avoid getting into a drought. 